In this lesson, we will review some introductory material for dynamic anatomy. Let's begin with an overview of the lesson. Okay, let's take a look at an overview of the introduction. There are three main things that I want you to take away from the introduction, and they are anatomical concepts, levels of structural organization, and anatomical references and terminology. The anatomical concepts that we will cover include complexity, variability and individuality, adaptability, connectivity, and asymmetry. The levels of structural organization are encapsulated in figure one, two. And let's blow the picture up so we can take a better look at it. And we will see that those structural levels include atoms, molecules, cells, tissues, organs, organ systems, and finally, organisms. Now for anatomical references and terminologies, I hope that's something that you remember from your bio class. Table 1.3 presents a nice refresher if you need it. And again, let's just blow this up and take a better look at it. And you can see in table 1.3 that he includes a list of all of the terms and their anatomical descriptors. So now if we blow out the whole concept map here, we have a nice schematic of the overview of the introduction. Now that we've completed the overview, let's explore each of these topics in more depth. This book is called Dynamic Human Anatomy, and the course is called Foundations and Analysis of Human Movement. Basically, what we are talking about here is functional anatomy. And that starts with anatomy, which is the study of the structure of organisms. This is so important because form dictates function. But if you're like me, my initial anatomy class was pretty sterile. Ironically, it seemed devoid of life and movement. But movement is life. So rather than looking at it statically, in this course, we're gonna take a look at anatomy dynamically. We developed this course because students were not able to connect what they learned in anatomy class to movement. So the whole purpose of this course is to make those connections. Let's begin by exploring some anatomical concepts. These include complexity, variability and individuality, adaptability, connectivity, and symmetry. Let's take a closer look at each of these concepts. Complexity. Complexity means a lot of different things to a lot of different people. We are going to define it using the old saying, the whole is more than the sum of the parts. Another way to think about it is that it's not just the individual parts that are working properly on their own, it's how those parts interact with each other that determines function. Variability and individuality. Variability and individuality essentially means that we are not all built the same. And if we're not all built the same, then we will not all move the same. If we are going to teach people how to move better, then we have to respect the fact that we can't put people into the same movement boxes. Look at the two runners on the screen. You'll note that they have very different body types. And even though they are both runners, they excel at very different aspects of running. Adaptability. Things change. Our bodies change. So when we move, our bodies respond to that movement and change. Our bodies will also change due to a lack of movement. This is best encapsulated by the said principle, specific adaptations to imposed demands. Let's take a look at those two runners again. They have very different body types, not only due to genetics, but also due to their type of training. Connectivity. There was a song that I learned as a child called Dem Bones. Now, I'm not gonna to torture you by singing it, but part of the lyrics state, the foot bones connected to the heel bone, the heel bones connected to the ankle bone, the ankle bones connected to the shin bone, and you get the idea. Everything is connected to everything else, even more so when we consider the fascial system of the body. Asymmetry. 
The idea of asymmetry is that the left side isn't a perfect match or mirror image for the right side. Even the medial side of a joint is not the mirror image of the lateral side of a joint. And since the body adapts to movement or lack thereof, movement or lack thereof can also amplify these asymmetries. Now that we've covered some of these anatomical concepts, let's take a look at the structural organization of the body. Now we're going to take a look at the levels of organization. I should start off by saying that matter is any substance that has mass and takes up space by having volume. Now atoms would be the smallest unit of ordinary matter that constitutes a chemical element. We can think of the periodic table as being a catalog of those atoms. Two or more atoms that are held together by a chemical bond make up molecules. Molecules can be homonuclear, which means they are atoms made up of one chemical element, such as oxygen, which are two oxygen molecules, I'm sorry, which are two oxygen atoms, or it can be heteronuclear, which are made up of more than one chemical element. Think of water, which is H2O, which is two hydrogen atoms and one oxygen atom. Next up on our level of organization would be cells. Cells are the basic building blocks of life. Cells have cytoplasm that contain the proteins and nucleic acids. Cells and extracellular matrix come together to create a tissue. Organs are comprised of two or more tissues that have a definite form and function. Organ systems will be groups of organs that work together to perform special functions, and those organ systems are housed together into a whole organism, such as a frog or a puppy or a human. All right, let's go back here and let's take a deeper dive into tissue. There are four different types of tissues. We have epithelial tissue, which covers and lines body surfaces, provides protection, and regulates secretion and absorption. We have nervous tissue, which is the body's communication system. We have connective tissue, which connects, binds, supports, and protects. And finally, we have muscle tissue, which has the unique ability to produce force. I won't say more about the epithelial or nervous tissue, but let's take a closer look at connective tissue and muscle tissue. Connective tissue includes things like bone and cartilage, tendons, ligaments, fat, and surprisingly, blood. Bonus points to anyone who can tell me why blood is considered to be a connective tissue. Now, if we go back here and we look at cartilage, there are going to be three different types of cartilage. Hyaline or articular cartilage lines bones that make contact with other bones. Fibrocartilage acts as a filler between bones and other connective tissues and include things like the menisci in the knee or the labrum in the hip and the shoulder. Flexible elastic cartilage is found in things like the ears and nose. Now let's jump over and take a look at muscle tissue. There are three types of muscle tissue. Cardiac muscle is found in the heart and is responsible for creating the forces that pump blood. Smooth muscle is found in and around various tracts in the circulatory, respiratory, digestive, urinary, and reproductive systems. It generates forces that move substances through those tracts. Skeletal muscle, though, is what we are primarily interested in this class. Skeletal muscle produces the forces that create movement. So finally, let's go up and let's take a look at some of the organ systems of the body. The cardiovascular system transports nutrients and oxygen to the cells and tissues and carries away waste products. I've heard the nervous system, skeletal system, and muscular system all refer to separately and in various combinations, such as 
the neuromuscular system, and the musculoskeletal system. To give you an idea about the interconnectedness of these systems, particularly where movement is concerned. It might be best to just simply refer to this as the neuromusculoskeletal system, or even more simply as the locomotor system. There are other systems within the body that are less important from a movement perspective, and we will largely ignore them for this class. So there you have the various levels of organization. Let's blow it up and take bird's eye view of these different levels. One of the questions I'm going to ask you is to discuss how the various levels of organization may affect one another. Finally, we will be using the correct anatomical terms in this class. I expect you to remember them, but if you don't, Table 1-3 in the textbook provides a nice summary of some of those terms. Let's return once again to an overview of this lesson and see what we went over. So what did we cover in this lesson? Well, again, we've looked at anatomical concepts, levels of structural organization, and anatomical references and terminology. For the anatomical concepts, we looked at complexity, variability and individuality, adaptability, connectivity, and asymmetry. The levels of structural organization in Figure 1-2 include atoms, molecules, cells, tissues, organs, organ systems, and organisms. And anatomical references and terminology were a refresher that were presented in Table 1.3. Again, these are the main takeaways from this lesson. So that's it for this lesson. I hope this will help you with the prep guide and allow you to participate in the discussions.